Good evening, everyone. My name is Jason Gadaik. I am with Brookside Gardens, a part of Montgomery Parks. So I'm one of the uh, co-sponsors of Montgomery County's Green Fest, which is Montgomery County's largest environmental festival. I'm happy to be with you folks here this evening. Um, we're excited to have all of you here. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, again, Green Fest typically is an annual event that's held in person. This year we've changed the format to um, be uh, more of a virtual format. So we have a lot of wonderful um, events um, going online. And I certainly encourage all of you folks to go ahead and check that out by going to montgomerycountygreenfest.org. Again, that's montgomerycountygreenfest.org and you can find all of the wonderful um, information there. Um, in terms of today's uh, lecture, uh, we're gonna be joined by um, a number of people from uh, the Montgomery County Department of Environmental Protection's Recycling and Resource Management Division. Um, and before we get started really quickly, we have uh, opened up the Q&A. Um, and if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you can click on that Q&A and type in your questions. There's also a wonderful format since we have such a large group online joining us, we might not be able to get to all of your questions. If you go ahead and look at the questions, you can have the option to like a question. Essentially, the more people that like the questions moves those questions to the top of the box, and that helps us to prioritize which questions get answered. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and introduce today, we have um, Alan Poltonewitz, who is Montgomery County's Recycling Coordinator. We have Kathy Vasquez, who is the Commercial Food Scraps Recycling Program Manager for Montgomery County's Department of Environmental Protection. And we're also gonna kick it off with Eileen Keo, who is the Chief of the Waste Reduction and Recycling Section in the Montgomery County Department of Environmental Protection. And she's the Chief for the Recycling and Resource Management Division. Uh, Ms. Keo leads a team that promotes the county's effort to reduce waste and reuse materials and recycle more and also to advance uh, and achieve the county's goals to reduce the waste and recycle, aiming ultimately for zero waste. With that, we'll go ahead and pass it on to Eileen. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. So glad to be here uh, with you this evening to talk about something that's very, very important, very near and dear to our hearts, and that is composting of food scraps, um, certain food scraps in the backyard. But I'd like to start um, by kind of recapping. So hopefully you all know that in 2018, we published our strategic plan to advance composting, compost use and food scraps diversion here in Montgomery County. For us, reducing the amount of wasted food, uh, making sure that any food that's in excess of someone's needs gets deployed or channeled to, to meet unmet needs of others, and then recycling as much food scrap material as possible. These are all very, very important efforts to us. We estimate that there are approximately 120,000 tons of food scraps that are actually disposed in the trash on an annual basis here in Montgomery County. So really food scraps are our next frontier material in terms of trying to increase um, our waste diversion, trying to increase the amount of recycling, all so that we can move the ball forward to try and make progress and ultimately to achieve our zero waste goals. So through our strategic plan, we actually looked in depth at six aspects of, um, of food scraps reduction, food scraps diversion. And to us, all of these six elements really are critically important because really there is not one solution to uh, our need to try and reduce wasted food and make sure that as much food um, that, that is then uh, remaining that cannot be consumed is actually separated for recycling and recycled. So we are making very, very good progress. We've gone from the strategic planning phase into developing and implementing programs um, to, uh, to accomplish all these great things. 
So some of the things that we are doing currently, we have our commercial food scraps partnership program, which we have now um, implemented in, in our um, managing on a day-to-day -day basis and we continue to, to work forward in that program. We've got a pilot program, which behind the scenes we have been um, planning out and hopefully soon we'll be really starting to implement. It's, it's a pilot program to provide curbside collection of food scraps to our single family households. We are gonna start with a, 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 on a pilot basis with about 1700 homes initially uh, participating in the pilot. We're also increasing and working on uh, educational materials, more and more education materials to try and uh, help people to reduce the amount of wasted food that they uh, generate to begin with and looking at ways again to, to take any foods that are in excess of one's needs and really trying to make sure that that goes towards meeting unmet needs of others. We're also working very concertedly to secure and develop um, facility capacity to process food scraps for recycling. In addition, um, can't leave out on-farm composting because again, that's also a very important element in sort of uh, our, our overall solution to our food scraps issue. And in terms of on-farm composting, we have been um, big supporters of an initiative that was recently passed, a zoning text amendment that was first sponsored and proposed by council member Evan Glass. And through the zoning text amendment, it's very exciting because it actually increases the amount of food scraps that, um, that can be brought onto a farm and processed in terms of food scraps. And it takes that from the 20% limit previously and boosts that to now 50%. So that's a very exciting initiative and we're very appreciative of council member Glass's uh, efforts in this very much so. And the big, uh, the big topic of this evening is another element, very important element, and that is uh, backyard composting of certain types of food scrap material. And that is what we're here this evening to talk about. So at this point, what I'm going to do, I would like to introduce Kathy Vasquez, Kathy has been um, with my section with our division and department for uh, a little over a year. And uh, she has got a wealth of knowledge and expertise and experience in a host of things, including um, trying to manage a core of recycling and composting volunteers, but also in terms of backyard composting incorporating food scraps and also community scale um, composting of food scraps. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Kathy. Uh, thank you so much, Eileen. Uh, I'm very excited to have everybody here today to talk about food scraps. It's something that is near and dear to my heart. Um, like Eileen said, I've had lots of experience with composting. I started my composting journey in uh, 2008 by becoming a master composter. And uh, I've done a lot of different things with composting, including composting food scraps in negative 13 degree weather. And I'm hoping that by the end of this presentation, you'll feel confident uh, to start uh, composting food scraps with the information that we provide to you. So um, before, so before we get started, um, we want to talk about what actually is composting. So composting is, is when a decomposition happens and all organic matters are broken down by specific organisms. So those organisms are going to break down organic materials either through physical or chemical decomposition and turn it into this stable soil amendment called humus. Uh, this is what happens in nature and it happens all the time. And when we talk about composting, what we mean is when 
humans are actually doing the work to speed up that decomp decomposition process. So we are gonna go over a couple of steps on what you can do to speed it up so you can um, process more materials, process materials faster, and additionally process materials without any problems. Um, before we get started, I want to uh, actually give you a poll question. I wanna see where you are in your composting experience. So Jason, could you uh, put up poll question number one? The question this evening is, if you could just share with us, what is your composting experience? If you're a beginner composter, an intermediate composter, or if you're considering yourself an advanced composter. Great. And it looks like most people are almost, it's almost all uh, filled out. So we can end polling now. So it looks like a lot of you are beginner composters, which is great. So the information that I'm going to be providing today and we're going to be talking about will definitely get you started on just understanding the basics of composting. Um, those of you who are, and the majority of you, and then the other half of you are intermediate at 28%. So those of you who are composting your leaves and garden trimming, um, what we'll go over today will help you understand how to input some of those food scraps into your, your compost. Uh, pile or compost bin. And then those of you who are advanced compost, uh, composters, um, hopefully you'll glean some great information today about what you can do to potentially speed up the process. And we can answer some questions if you're, if you're having any trouble with, your, uh, with composting your food scraps. So let's move on. With composting, there are four different things that you're gonna to need to do in order to make compost. One, you're gonna need brown material. So your brown materials are your carbon rich and they're usually dead and dry. Green materials are anything that is nitrogen rich um, and we'll go over specific types of, these specific types of materials later on, but I just want you to become familiar with, with the language that we're gonna be using. And green materials tend to be moist and alive. You're gonna need air or aeration, uh, and that can come in many different ways. That could be by you mixing or turning your pile. That can also be by adding different types of materials into your pile to create some pore spaces or air spaces in the pile. And lastly, you're gonna need water. And you can get water in your compost pile a couple of different ways. One, you can add more green material because they are moist and they have moisture, or you can add water if that's something that you would want to do. And then by adding all these materials uh, to your pile or to a bin in the proper amounts, you're gonna make compost. And it seems pretty simple because it is, it's really straightforward. So who's doing the composting work? So in a compost pile, one of the, things that I like to tell people is you have to think of it as an ecosystem. So whether or not you're using a geo bin that the county provides, or if you're using a tumbler, um, you're going to have different types of organisms in that pile that are going to be eating different types of things. The great thing about it is they're going to come to your pile no matter what. If you, I like to say, if you build it, they will come. Uh, and you won't need to add any worms, you won't need to add any specific type, types of activator. They are actually living on the materials that you're putting on your pile. And if you manage everything correctly, they're gonna grow. So you're gonna be, your compost pile, you're, you're, what you're trying to do is uh, make sure everything is managed well so you can have a party so these organisms know that that's where they wanna be. how to make the organisms thrive. So you might have learned this before in biology uh, and there's the simple things that all organis or organisms need to live. You're gonna need food. So when we're talking about a compost pile, you're gonna want a mix of browns and greens, carbon and nitrogen. And 
those things will help bring those organisms to the pile. All egg organisms need air. So good aeration is going to keep the organisms alive in the pile, and that's what we want. We want good aeration so we can have aerobic decomposition uh, and make sure that you don't get any um, smelly or odor pockets in your pile. And additionally, since all organisms need moist, uh, water, you want to make sure that your pile has water and moisture. And you want to keep your pile wet but not soaking. And we'll go over this in detail a little later on. What types of materials can you add? So there's a bunch of different materials that people talk about about adding into your pile. Um, this is new for us as a county where we're asking or we're um, giving people information about different types of vegetable fruit scraps that you can actually add that will be beneficial. So when we're talking about nitrogen rich materials, those are things that are fresh and moist uh, and they're called green materials. So that's gonna be your fruits and vegetable scraps, your plant trimming, your grass, flowers, pruning, coffee grounds, and filters. I know that seems kind of weird because coffee grounds are brown in color, but they're actually have really high in nitrogen. So that's why they fall in the green category. You can add in fresh hay or grass and tea, tea bags and loose tea. For the carbon rich brown, you those are things that are dead and dry. And brown materials are uh, eggshells, bread and pasta, nut and nut shells, any food, so food soiled paper tiles or napkins you may have, dry leaves or twigs, wood chips, straw, uh, dry uh, cotton rags, dry lint or cooled wood ash. So this is all the types of materials that you can add into a compost pile to make sure that you are providing the food that's necessary specifically for those organisms that we want them to survive and thrive. What are some examples of, of food scraps? So for vegetables and their trimmings, we're talking about beet tops and carrots and any of those old potatoes that you might have in your, in your pantry that sprouted or any mold, like a moldy or wilted celery. It happens to me all the time and those things can be added into your compost pile. Uh, fruit cores and peels. So any banana peels, any avocados, avocado pits, uh, any fruit seeds such as like peach, or um, peach pits or plum pits. Uh, those things are very okay to put into your pile. They may take a little longer, the pits, because they are very high in carbon, but they will eventually break down. Then we're talking, then you can add your coffee grounds and the filter. The filters are completely fine. They will eventually break down and any tea bags and loose tea. Um, with the tea bags, you just want to test out to make sure that it is compostable. Some tea bags are made out of plastic um, and you will quickly find out that they're not breaking down uh, within the first week of composting because they'll stay exactly the same. Any bread and pasta. So if you have any moldy bread or old uh, moldy pasta in your refrigerator that can very much be added into your compost pile. Uh, nuts and nutshells. Uh, eggshells are completely fine. What I would suggest with any eggshells, they do take a very long time to break down. So if you can chop these up a little smaller than you would chop up all, all the other materials, it will help it break down a little bit faster. And then any cold soil, paper, towels, or napkins. Um, and as you can see, there are lots of different types of materials that you can add into your pile. But there are some that we are recommending that you don't add because they may cause problems. So what shouldn't be added into your pile? You should not add any dairy products such as butter, eggs, yolk, milk, sour cream, etc. Disease or insect ridden plants, fat, grease, lards or oils, meat or fish bones and scraps, or any pet waste. Um, these things uh, can be taken at large scale facilities because they are managed specifically to make sure that they can uh, get rid of any potential um, disease, especially for the plants or, uh, any, or anything else like that. But if you try to do this in your backyard, um, it may cause, it, it will definitely cause problems because uh, it's just such a, it, 
it's, it's, a, it's a smaller pile. And you want to make sure that if you uh, are using any of these materials, um, it, you're going to get kind of anaerobic decomposition, and that's going to cause smells and odors, and it may potentially attract uh, other animals to your pile that you don't want, such as uh, critters, as such as mice or rats. So we recommend that you don't put any of these materials into your pile. So there's a little ladder that I like to talk about uh, when talking about backyard composting. Um, and the reason why it's set up like this is because the stuff on the bottom is the easiest to manage. So for those of you who are beginners and you wanna start composting, I would always suggest just to start with your yard and garden trimmings. Uh, those are the ones that are going to cause the least amount of problems and you don't have to manage it as much. And when I say managing, it means you don't have to put as much time and effort into it in order to make compost and in order to make sure that things are breaking down okay. The next rung of that ladder would be adding any raw fruits and vegetable scraps. So uh, as you're adding, uh, once, you've, once you've made compost with yard and, yard and garden trimmings, then I would say, okay, start adding your fruits and, fruits and vegetable scraps. Because now you know what the basic ways of managing the materials are. And, you, and as you're adding the, fruit, the fruits and vegetable scraps, it becomes a lot easier. The next rung of the ladder is uh, cooked vegetable scraps. And the reason why that's a little bit above uh, fruits and vegetables, raw fruits and vegetables, is because there may be oils on that. And even though they're a little bit of oil, um, they could potentially cause odors in your uh, compost bin. So, when you're doing that, um, it when you add it after you've added raw fruit scraps, you, you you'll understand. Oh, now I know what's causing the odor instead of not know, knowing where that odor is coming from. And then the last thing on there would be um, bread tosses and grains. Uh, the reason why I say that should be the last one is because if you add any bread tosses and grains in a very large quantity, it can potentially cause. Um, uh, uh, lots of mold pockets in your um, in your compost pile, and some people don't like that. Uh, and it's, it, a lot of the time, it's completely fine. It's fine to have that in there because mold is one of the decomposers that break it down. But um, if you add too much of it, it can cause issues with uh, uh, just some anaerobic decomposition in your pile. So we're gonna stop right now, uh, and we're gonna look at your questions that you've been uh, asking in the in the q a and um alan can you tell me some questions that you have there sure uh, kathy let me uh, go through a couple of uh, specific items that uh, folks are asking if they can be uh, added um, cooked pasta or dry pasta so you can definitely add cooked pasta or dry pasta it is completely fine and like i had said in the beginning moisture is very important to um, composting so uh, if you're adding dry pasta, you're going to need a little bit more moisture because uh, that's just it's a little harder for it to break down. Uh, regarding pits like avocado and peach pits, um, will they sprout? And what uh, about yard trimmings with weeds? OK, so for avocados and peach pits, um, occasionally an avocado pit will sprout, um, but they take they require a lot of, of whole lot of moisture in order for them to sprout for an extended period of time. So it may not happen in your compost pile. Um, the peach pits in my or any of the stone fruits, uh, in my experience, have never, um, never sprouted. Uh, but uh, you, it, it can happen. I could imagine it can happen, but I haven't seen it happen. And then um, regarding weeds. So if you're planning on adding weeds to your compost pile, my suggestion is to add them to your pile before the flower uh, comes out. So um, the reason being is if you uh, chop and uh, get your chop down your weeds before the flower comes out, then you're not adding those weed seeds into your compost pile. Um, if you uh, don't care about weed seeds, then uh, you can put weeds uh, at any point in time into your compost pile. But I would recommend if you're concerned about if you have mugwort or any other type of weed uh, that that may spread, uh, just do it before the, the seeds are present on the plant. Kathy, we do have a comment about eggshells. Uh, they asked that after two years of composting, they've never really totally broken down in their compost bin. Should they keep putting them in their compost bin? 
Yeah, so you can keep putting them in the compost bin and every and um, when you harvest your compost, um, you can either uh, add the, the shells back into your compost pile um, or as you're harvesting, they usually break down into smaller bits and you can put that directly into your soil and it's completely fine. Um, the organisms in the soil will do the same decomposition and it'll eventually break down. And Kathy, I know you mentioned uh, dryer lint, but it seems like that question's uh, popping up to the top here. So could dryer lint have non-natural fibers? Um, some dryer lint can have non-natural fibers, uh, such as polyester or some uh, plastics. Um, so you'll, it, you'll see when you are composting, if you put it in and it doesn't decompose, uh, dryer, in my experience, when I've done dryer lint, it usually goes pretty fast because the fibers are really tiny. Uh, if it doesn't decompose, you can always remove the part that is not decomposing and you can put that into your trash. Okay, and the questions are moving on me as I'm looking at them. So okay. uh, <laughs> for fruit and vegetable scraps, does it really matter if they are cooked or not? So it's, it's it matters in terms of uh, whether or not you feel comfortable that you have a handle on raw fruits and vegetable scraps. As you move up the ladder, like I said, the oils on there could potentially pose problems. And um, the, the way that I presented it, um, it just makes sure that you know kind of where that issue is coming from. If you want to try your luck and add the cooked vegetable scraps with the raw scraps, and see if you can manage it without getting any uh, issues such as anaerobic decomposition or any odors or anything like that, you can definitely add it. But you know, my recommendation is wait, make compost with raw fruits and vegetable scraps, make sure you have that down and then move on to adding uh, raw, um, move on to adding cooked uh, vegetable scraps. Okay, so Kathy, I think we got most of those initial questions for this part. Uh, okay. Before you go on, I just want to remind everyone the slides will be available as well as tonight's recording on our GreenFest webpage, which is MontgomeryCountyGreenFest.org. You can slide down to today's date and both tonight's recording as well as the slides will be posted on the website, which is MontgomeryCountyGreenFest.org. And Kathy, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you, Alan. Um, and this won't be the only time we'll have another portion of Q&A at the end. So let's move on. So we talked about what materials you can add to your pile. You asked some really great questions about uh, what happens to those materials, but let's talk about actually how to compost your fruit scraps. So on the left here, you have a really great image of uh, fruit scraps in a compost bin. So what do you need to do to your material? First, you're gonna have to chop everything into smaller pieces. The next thing you're gonna do, you're gonna add your browns and green material to your backyard compost bin in a two to one by volume. And we'll get into detail about all of this in uh, later slides. Next, you're gonna to wanna to mix all those browns and greens together so that they look uh, homogenous and they look all nice and mixed up and you can't really um, pick out the browns and, and greens from each other. And then the last thing you wanna do, like I said before, is keep your palm moist by adding more greens or adding water. And definitely you don't, you want to make sure that they are no exposed food scraps. So in a compost pile, um, our, the best management practices are you should add um, three, uh, two to three inches of brown materials on top of the food scraps to make sure nothing is exposed. Um, before we go to the next slide, uh, we do have a question. Alan um, or Jason, can you pop up the poll question? So the question we're asking this evening, question number two, how long does it take to make finished stable compost? Four weeks, one to two months, three to six months, or more than a year? Thank you, Alan. So we got 68%, I'll leave it open for a little while longer. Let's see if we get anybody else. Great, and Jason, can you end the poll? Thank you. So uh, this is a trick question because it depends. Um, so four weeks is a very short amount of time. Uh, there are 
uh, interesting things on the internet that will claim to make compost in four weeks. But in my experience, uh, that is very difficult to do um, just because it, it takes time for the macro and microorganisms to do the work of decomposition. Um, for those of you who answered one to two months, you can definitely try to make compost in one to two months, but it takes a lot of uh, management. So it takes you going out there and checking the pile and making sure the moisture is right and making sure it's turned and making sure you have the right materials. Um, so in order for you to do that, so that would be you becoming very committed to your compost pile for that time period. The best time frame uh, is three to six months. Uh, and that's when you can actually make finished stable compost uh, the majority of the time uh, without having to do as much management, without having to check on your pile every day. Um, and if you're like me, which I, I'm a very efficient composter, AKA I am very lazy. Uh, I will manage my pile only when I need to. So sometimes I get compost in three to six months. Sometimes I get it in more than a year. Um, so hopefully that clears up any questions that you folks have around composting, uh, how long it takes uh, to compost. Let's go to the next slide. So like I said before, uh, when, you, uh, when you're making compost, one of the things you have to worry about is uh, how big your materials are. So with composting, size matters. Um, and the reason is, is that uh, the organisms that are eating the materials in your pile, they're tiny, they have tiny mouths or they have no mouths at all. Um, and so by decreasing the size of the material, you're increasing the surface area and you're providing them with more opportunities to eat the material faster. So, so the more surface area, the quicker those organic materials are going to uh, go down. But there is uh, a thing as things being too small. So you want to make sure that you're not chopping them very, very small because it might result in compaction and decrease air circulation. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're going to about four to six inches of the size of your hand. And this is when we're talking about yard trimmings. Um, and then any of your, um, like, any of the watermelon rind or any rinds from any large fruits and vegetables, you want to make sure that they're about four to six inches or the size of your hand. So when we are managing browns and greens, and we talked about that earlier, you want to make sure that you're adding browns and greens material to your compost bin in a two to one buy volume. So what does that mean? We have a nifty little graphic that's going off on the bottom. It means for every two buckets of browns, you're going to add one bucket of greens. Um, and after that, you're going to mix those browns and greens together and then add them uh, and, and add them into your compost bin. You can mix them in your compost bin, you can mix them in a wheelbarrow and then put them into your compost bin, but just make sure that that mixture is completely mixed up, that, that, that there's browns and greens touching throughout the mixture, and this will increase the uh, amount of, it will decrease the amount of time that it takes to make compost. Water is the next important thing to monitor in your compost pile. Um, the optimal moisture content is 50, 60, 50 to 60 percent, but who can measure that, right? So the reason why you want moisture in your compost pile is because uh, too much moisture um, can slow down decomposition and can drown the organisms. But if it's too dry, the smaller microorganisms that are there are not going to be able to move around in your pile um, to eat the material. So you're aiming for 50 to 60%, which like the image shows is not like a not like a dripping sponge, but it's like a wrung out sponge. So that's what you're aiming for. And you'll be able to tell the moisture uh, of your pile about two to three days after you mix everything up and put it in there. You can't really tell the moisture uh, the first time you add materials into the pile because the um, cell walls of the fruit scraps need to burst before you can figure out how much moisture is in there. So which materials contain moisture? So nitrogen rich materials often contain moisture and then carbon rich materials are often very dry. So if you wanna add more moisture into your bin, um, you're gonna wanna add more greens or, or brown or greens material. If you find that your pile is super wet that you added way too many greens, you're gonna wanna add some more brown materials into there. And then the other important part for all the organisms to survive is air. So 
air is definitely required for proper decomposition. You might have heard me talk about aerobic before, so that where that comes from, you want to make sure that there's oxygen in there. Um, during composting, uh, O2 is going to be consumed by all the organisms, and then CO2 increases. So this is what, what I was talking about earlier. You want to make sure that there's bulky material in there so that CO2 can escape, so that way you can make sure that your pile stay, stays aerobic and has enough oxygen for all those macro and microorganisms that are in there. Um, if the oxygen goes lower, it becomes anaerobic and you can get odors uh, and we're trying to prevent that. And then there's a couple of different things that you can do to increase the amount of oxygen in your pile. One, you can turn or mix it. Um, you can simply poke holes in it. There's, you can add a, use a pitchfork to uh, poke holes or there's a fancy tool called a wing dinger and you just poke some holes in there. Or I actually like adding bulky brown material. So that would be any twigs or branches cut down to four to six inches and adding them in there because that will provide um, pockets in your pile for air to kind of go through. And I feel like that's the best way because it also allows for any excess moisture to leave as well. And then after you do all that, you're going to want to check the temperature. So decomposition produces heat, and the temperature is definitely going to be affected by heat, the moisture content. So if it's too dry, you're going to have very low temperature. Airflow, like I said before, if you have compacted material in there, it's going to, uh, you're going to have low temperature because the organisms are not going to be able to breathe. Um, it's going to be impacted by your carbon to nitrogen ratio or your ground to green mix. So if you add too much nitrogen or too many grains, uh, you're going to, it's going to uh, turn the pile uh, to anaerobic and it's going to cause uh, the pile temperature to go down. And then the last thing is the size of the pile. So um, common recommendations are for any size of the pile to be about three feet by three feet by three feet. Um, but most uh, Plastic compost bins are a little bit smaller than that. Uh, I've been able to get a pile to the 120 degree in that size. And it's just about managing all the things above that. So making sure you have a right brown to green ratio, making sure you have airflow and the right moisture. And in composting, you're, you're aiming for an, a temperature between 104 to 102, oh, uh, sorry, 104 to 122 degrees Fahrenheit for at least five days. Um, and then if it goes above 140, that means that your pile is too high, hot and your decomposition is gonna slow down. So if you're not getting those temperatures and that's what you're aiming for, you have to look at to see uh, if you have the right moisture, if you have the right airflow, if you have the right brown to green or carbon to nitrogen ratio. If it does get really hot, so it gets up to 140 pi, uh, degrees, it could mean a couple of different things. It could be that your pile is too large um, or it could be that it, you just have uh, a material, a type of material, a type of green in there that just has a lot of nitrogen. So if it does get that hot, I would recommend um, turning your pile and adding some bulky material so that way you can get some airflow. So what is the best placement for your bin? You want to make sure that your bin is in a level, well-drained space in, in from any property line. You're going to want to place your bin at least two to three feet away from walls and, and other structures. Uh, that be that's because uh, one, it makes it easier for you to manage your bin because you can access your bin from all sides, and two, it also um, prevents rodents or any other critters from uh, poking around in your bin because they, there's a lot of open space where they could potentially get eaten by a hawk or other animals. Um, Additionally, you want to keep the area around the compost bin free from clutter and tall growing plants. Uh, again, the reason why we want to keep it free from clutter, um, it just makes it easier for you and other and anyone else who's managing your bin to gain access to it. And then you want to make sure that the, any tall plants or weeds are removed from around it for the same reason as uh, the second point. It's because you want to make sure that uh, you're not making a habitat for any pests or, or rodents that may potentially want to live next to your compost pile. And this is a nice but not necessary, but it may help you out. Um, you can create a separate brown, brown pile 
to use later for mixing. Uh, this is just a common practice that I like to do because you can't fit all the browns into this um, green or uh, into this black uh, compost bin on the side. So if you put uh, like the arrows pointing to, if you have a browns pile, then you'll just have that material ready for when you bring out your food scraps uh, and then you need to mix, uh, mix the materials and add them into your bin. So we do have, Oh, and then this is an example of poor bin placement. So you can see there's um, some a lot of weeds growing up around it. They're, they're really close to each other, which is going to make it very difficult to manage. There's a lot of trees around it, so you really can't get access to it with a pitchfork to mix or turn it. Um, and there's just a lot of clutter. So we really try to make sure the area around the bin is nice and clean. Um, and that you have space so that way you can manage your bin. And then we do have uh, our last poll question, poll number four. Jason, can you pop that up here? So really quickly, we didn't do the question number three yet from my understanding. Did, is that what you wanted instead? Oh yeah, it's fine. We can do it. <laughs> Sorry about that, Jason. Thank you to answer this question. Have you ever experienced issues with odors or unwanted visitors to your compost bin? And Kathy, after this question, we do have a number of questions that have come up to, uh, specific to this issue. I can read off those questions once the polling is done. Okay, great. So it looks like most of you have answered it. Uh, so we can end polling. So the majority of you have uh, said yes that they that they have experienced um, some odors. So uh, hopefully by understanding how to best compost by managing your browns and greens by doing a specific ratio, you'll be able to decrease the amount of odors uh, that you have to the, your bin. Additionally, because of the way the um, your bins are placed, uh, maybe since spring is just starting, you can find another location or clean out the area to make sure that your there are no unwanted visitors. Um, so let's answer some questions, any potential questions that people have. Do you want to uh, ask them, Alan? Yeah, Kathy. Uh, so uh, there have been a couple of uh, questions or comments regarding residents putting grass, leaves, clippings, and vegetable matter, but still having problems with rodents. They mm -hmm. purchase expensive plastic composting containers and the rodents ate through it. What what are we doing wrong? Okay, so um, it could be a couple of different things. One is it could be that you, you may potentially live in an area that just has a really high rodent population um, and you need to look at a community scale way of addressing the rodents that are there. Um, if you want to, uh, if you haven't yet, one way, and I used to do this in New York City a lot, um, is to manage the rodents is you have to poke around your pile a lot. What that means is you may have to disturb your pile because nobody likes noisy and loud neighbors. Um, so if you mix your pile every two to three days to make sure that rodents are in, in there, um, that could potentially decrease the amount of activity that you see. But if they are, um, if, like I said, if, if there are a lot of rodents in the neighborhood, um, you have to address the community scale rodent issue. Uh, one thing that I found out that horrified me, but it's good to know, is that rod uh, rats um, specifically can live on uh, an, an ounce of food in a day. Um, and that ounce of food can come from any animal fecal matter. So if you have folks who are not picking up their uh, pet waste or if you have feral cats, uh, in your community, then they could be potentially eating those things and then just uh, chopping away at your compost bin, even though they might not be eating anything in your compost bin. Alan, do you have anything to add to that? No, and uh, again, there are several questions regarding uh, rodents. So you cover, I think, all those questions. Uh, one other question about another type of uh, pest, uh, ants. Someone is finding ants in their compost bin. Does it mean that their compost bin is too dry? Will water, adding water take care of the issue? Yeah, so whoever said that, that is correct. That means your compost bin is too dry. Um, so you would have to add more water. Um, and then additionally, the same thing as you would do for any rodents. 
uh, you would just have to mix your pile a little more often uh, to make sure that you're making that water distributed throughout your pile. Um, since we're stopping here, let's ask question number three really quickly about the bin. Jason, could you put that up? So the question is, if you are already composting at home, what type of compost bin are you using? We have provided the geo bin compost bin predominantly for yard trim. It's completely open on the top or bottom with a lot of aeration holes. Or do you have an other stationary type of compost bin with a lid? Are you using a tumbler? Are you vermicomposting? Or do you have more than one type of compost bin that you use? Great, it looks like the majority of people answered. Um, Jason, could you end the poll? So, it looks, the majority of you are either using a uh, yard trim, uh, Geobin uh, from Montgomery County, which is great. Um, and then the other folks are have a different type of bin or are using a tumbler. So we will go over kind of how to manage a stationary bin. And then additionally, we'll go over what's the best way to manage a tumbler because uh, when you're processing your food scraps, you wanna kind of treat them a little bit differently. So how to choose or what, to, what should you choose when you're um, thinking about a stationary bin? One, you wanna, choose a compost bin that has a lid. Um, the secure lid really does help with preventing any um, critters from entering your pile. Additionally, um, it also helps regulate the moisture that may, that is gonna be in your pile. Um, the moisture will condense on the sides of the pile and then go back in. Um, this may help with folks who have rodent issues if the, if the rodents are entering from the bottom. Uh, we suggest adding a half inch gauge harbor cloth on the ground. If you can see in the picture that's on the right, uh, that person actually elevated it and also has some uh, cloth to prevent critters from entering in. And then you wanna make sure that hardware cloth extends beyond the bin by four to five inches all around. So that may be helpful for folks who are experiencing some issues with rodents because they may be entering your compost bin from below ground. Like I had said before, you wanna make sure if you are doing food scraps that you're covering everything with brown material, three to four inches is a good uh, measurement to use. Uh, and so at the end, after you've added your compost, your food scraps into your compost bin, just add a layer of leaves or a layer of brown twigs in three to four inches on top. And then you wanna turn your pile frequently every one to two weeks. So what happens if you have exposed food scraps? So if this is how you are leaving your compost pile at the end of the day, um, one thing you may see a couple of hours later is these soldier fly maggots. Um, they are great. They eat food really quickly. However, um, they will turn into flies. So if you open up your pile and you see a bunch of flies that fly out that are relatively large, it's coming from these folks. Additionally, if you have too many of these in your pile, um, what will happen is, is they secrete, a, a, their secretions are, are called frass. And what that does, it, it skews your compost bin so that way it becomes low oxygen and anaerobic because they prefer that. So you may experience some odors if you do have exposed fruit scraps. So adding that three to four uh, inches of browns on the top will prevent this from happening. So what are some best practices for tumblers? Um, tumblers can be your best friend or it can be your worst enemy because uh, they can be slightly tricky and you wanna manage them a little bit differently. So tumblers work best when you do batch composting. And what I mean by that is um, you have to set it and forget it. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna have a container that stores all of your food scraps. You're gonna store that um, in your garage or in your freezer or in your refrigerator and then wait till you have a good size quantity of material. And then you're going to add the browns and greens into the tumbler and at the same time, mix everything up and then you're gonna wait. 
And that is the best way to use a, bat, a Tumblr, and that's batch composting. Um, people who have problems with tumblers, what will happen is they'll continuously add food scraps into the bin and it'll um, become really heavy. It'll become low oxygen because there's a lot of moisture in it um, and it becomes difficult to manage. So by doing a batch composting where you save everything up and set it and forget it, you'll uh, avoid a lot of those problems. Um, and like I said, greens can be saved in different containers in the fridge or freezer or in your, in your garage, if you don't mind it being slightly smelly if you uh, uh, keep it in your garage. Um, and then you're going to use the same ratio. You're going to add browns and greens into your tumbler in a two to one ratio. So we are coming to the end of our presentation, and these are just additional resources uh, for you. Uh, like Alan had said before, uh, We'll send this out so you'll have these links to all of the different um, areas where you can find more information on composting and specifically food scraps. And then this is our information. So if you want, if you have a specific composting problem or you specifically want to talk to me about vermicomposting, please reach out to me or Alan and we will get back to you as soon as possible. So that being said, Alan, do we have any additional questions that we can answer at this time? Sure. Yeah, we still have we still have a few minutes. Uh, we okay. still have a number of questions that have come in. Uh, so, Kathy, can you uh, explain a little bit more what is hardware cloth? Oh yes. Yeah. So, um, hardware cloth is. Um, let me go back to that slide. I know it's a little difficult to see here. Um, so, hardware cloth you can pick it up at um, any home like a. Home uh, goods store like Home Depot or Lowe's, um, and it is usually in the garden aisle. It is made out of metal, uh, and it comes in different sizes. There's a half inch gauge and a quarter inch gauge, um, and it just comes in a big roll. And what you would do is you would cut a piece of that out, that and make sure that it extends a little bit beyond your bin, and then put that on the floor, and then put your compost bin on top of that, um, and that'll help prevent critters from uh burrowing in the ground and then going into your compost bin and kathy one comment uh and question even if you cover your food scraps you per montgomery county's code you must use a rodent proof container if you put food scraps in your compost bin so you, you would have to containerize that so it's not exposed even if you cover the food scraps with some brown materials uh, Kathy, how do we use the uh, finished compost? Is it so rich it could burn plants? What about blending it into the soil and soil and po so soil poor areas? Okay, yeah. So um, you can use finished compost in a different in a couple of different ways. Um, when it's finished, when you have some compost, it's going to be on the bottom, like this image has here for, uh, with this earth machine. Uh, you're going to harvest it from the bottom, and it's going to look like soil. Um, if you want to check to make to see if it is finished, there's a simple thing you can do called a bag test, uh, and or you can do a jar test. Uh, so you can use a Ziploc bag or an old pasta jar and add some of your compost that you think is ready uh, and add it into that bin and close it off. Um, and then check it in a couple of days. And if you open it and there is no odor, that means that your compost is completely finished. Uh, if it if you open it and there, there is odor, that means that you still have um, some additional material in there that needs to be broken down. Uh, and I would tell you to wait a couple of weeks and then check again to, make, to, to do that test to see if it's completely cured. Uh, the compost that, if it, if, if, if it is finished and you uh, did the test and everything worked that well, um, it will not burn your plant. So uh, we suggest uh, adding just about one to two inches. You can add them across your garden beds, one to two inches at the beginning of the season, or you can do side dressing around the plants that you feel like you need it. So I would not add compost straight up against the plants. I would uh, add the compost about one to two inches away from the plant in a ring. Uh, and uh, that will not only be great for the plant, but you will not be feeding all the weeds in your garden bed. Um, and it'll help your compost last a little longer. Kathy, a few questions regarding placement of the compost bins. Uh, 
does it depend if it's in a sunny location versus a shady location? It only depends on if uh, you, uh, you yourself uh, can't be in the sun for too long. So what I would say is make sure that it's two to three uh, feet away from any walls and on your property line, and then put it in a space that is convenient for you and that you don't mind being in. Um, if you know that you're gonna be in your compost bin a lot, I would say just putting it into a shady location so that way it's easier for you to be out in the sun in the middle of summer and it's completely fine. Um, or, uh, and if you do uh, end up putting it out in the sun, it's not gonna speed up or slow down the process really. Um, all of them, the organisms are the ones who are creating the heat in your pile. And Kathy, always uh, what we always get asked a lot with these presentations with we go over what's acceptable, a couple of questions that came in regarding acceptable items. What about invasives such as garlic, mustard, or ivy? Would that be acceptable? Gar oh, garlic, mustard, or ivy. So, um, so ivy is an interesting one because it can propagate um, through the cuttings. So if you know it's invasive and you know how it spreads, um, I would say uh, you can put them into the pickup, the yard trim pickup, and uh, at, at the large scale facility where your yard trim goes to, uh, it will get composted in a way that will um, make sure that it dies. Uh, if for anything like that, if you're concerned, uh, there's a saying, if, it, if in doubt, leave it out. Um, I would just leave it out of your pile. A commercial tea bags again, are they acceptable? Yeah, tea bags are completely fine. Um, there are some, the majority of tea bags um, are made out of paper, but there are some weird ones out there that are made out of plastic. So uh, you can check that. And I do this perpetually in compost bins. I check to see if something is compostable. I will add it to my compost pile and kind of mark it with a popsicle stick and then go back there in a couple of weeks and see if it has broken down. And if you notice that it's not broken down, then you can start, you can put that into your regular trash. And Kathy, if a grass trimmings dry out, would they be considered green or brown at that point? Yeah, great question. So uh, if grass clippings do dry out, they would be considered a brown because they don't have any more moisture um, and they are really dead. So, uh, they, so some of your materials, you're gonna be waiting and then they're gonna turn from uh, greens to browns and that's fine because then you can just add it as a brown when you're adding healthy scraps and one last question i think we'll cover we're wrapping, getting close to wrapping up here uh someone has a compost bin and when they open up there tends to be a lot of insects uh and they tend to be annoying is there anything they can do to address that issue so it kind of depends on the type of insect that there is um if there's a lot of moisture on the top of your bin or uh, on the uh, in the top part of your bin, you can add the, the three to four inches of browns and that should help decrease the amount of insects that are there. So any like um, fungus gnats or fruit flies or anything like that, that may potentially be in the top of the pile. They like to be very close to the soil surface or the surface of things. So if you add those three to four inches of browns, it will, um, control them being there. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Eileen? Ellen, so have we covered the questions? Yeah, I think we covered the majority of the questions. And again, we're always, you can reach out to Kathy or myself. Go ahead, Eileen. Yeah. So I was remiss. We, um, we neglected to introduce Alan. And Alan's been helping with the questions and the chat um, comments this evening. But Alan is our recycling coordinator, and he has been with the Waste Reduction and Recycling Section in um, Recycling and Resource Management Division of DEP now for 21 years. And Alan is responsible for outreach, education, technical assistance, training on the whole gamut, waste reduction, reuse, recycling, grass cycling, composting, buying recycled. And so he also has a lot of experience. Um, many of you may know him from the training workshops and our backyard composting using the geo bins, um, which are really meant for grass and leaves and garden trimmings. Um, but yes, Alan, sorry about that. Need Thank you, Alan, appreciate that. Introduce you. 
And I'll just remind everyone before we turn it back over to Jason to wrap up this evening, uh, the slides and the recording tonight will be on the Greenfest webpage, which is montgomerycountygreenfest.org. All of our information about our food scraps recycling efforts can be found on our food scraps recycling page, which is montgomerycountymd.gov slash food scraps. I answered a couple of questions earlier. The strategic plan is also directly linked from our food scraps page. So all the information regarding the different programs Eileen mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation this evening, you can get a great list of information on our website, montgomerycountymd.gov slash food scraps. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Jason. Oh, before we turn it to Jason, I have one other thing. Thank you, Alan, so much. Um, the, the, the last thing is uh, we have a evaluation, which I will uh, drop in the chat. Um, and if you can, oops, all attendees and panelists. Okay, great. So if you can fill that out and let us know and provide us any feedback about the presentation, that would be great. Uh, it'll help us make better presentations in the future. And now we can turn it over to Jason. Great. Well, thank you all so much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you to Eileen. Thank you to Kathy and to Alan. I certainly learned a lot. I've been composting for years, but I certainly still learned quite a lot from this. So I really appreciate all of this. And again, just a reminder, everyone, that this is a part of um, our ongoing GreenFest activities. Uh, most of them are virtual, uh, and this is just one lecture in a series of them. Uh, it was on Tuesday. Uh, we're going to be having a panel discussion um, based on a movie called The Story of Plastic. It's going to be moderated by um, Adam Ortiz, who is the director of the Department of Environmental Protection for Montgomery County. We've got a wonderful selection of panelists, so it's not too late to register for that. This is in conjunction with the partnership between uh, GreenFest and the DC Environmental Film Festival. So again, if you register online, you can certainly go to Montgomery County GreenFest Dot org, and I'll include a link to uh, that program uh, along with a link to the recording, but I encourage you all to sign up for that. It's going to be a fascinating discussion and we send you um, a link to watch the free recording. And finally, our last uh, virtual event as part of GreenFest and Earth Month in April is going to be next Thursday. That's April 29th. We're going to have a wonderful uh, virtual demonstration of how to create a container uh, with native plants. And so that's going to also be with Ann English with DEP as well. And so uh, part of that, we're going to be having a drawing for um, to give away the free native plant container that she's going to be uh, creating. So that's really popular. Again, thank you all so much. We'll go ahead and send out that um, link to watch recording tomorrow, along with the slides from today's uh, session. And we appreciate all of you so much and uh, stay tuned. Take care, everyone.